interesting conversation this week. It had to do with, uh, it was with somebody who is not able to come while we are um, wearing masks and keeping ourselves safe from contagions. And they told me that they really enjoy catching our services online. And then they mentioned that when they are unable to, for whatever reason, catch our services, they tune in to hear someone named Dr. David Jeremiah. Oddly, David Jeremiah is a little better known than I am. He has his own radio station, radio program, which broadcasts every day all across the United States. We broadcast our services each Sunday morning at 9.30 here in Grand Junction, which means that if you're in Denver, you don't hear me on the radio. If you're in Kalamazoo, Michigan, you don't hear me on the radio. If you're in California, if you're anywhere other than Grand Junction, you don't hear me on the radio. Okay, actually, the Western Slope, because it does carry beyond just Grand Junction, but you can hear David Jeremiah anywhere. David Jeremiah has written over 40 books. I've written two. Matter of fact, this week I saw one in the trash. A copy of my book. I pulled it out, and it didn't even look like it had been read. Like, okay, I understand. I wrote it. I'm not sure I would read it. By the way, in the same trash bin was one of David Jeremiah's books, so I can't feel too bad. It is kind of cool to be spoken of positively in connection with someone with the type of renown as Dr. David Jeremiah. But it got me to thinking, what characters in the Bible would I be compared to? To whom would I relate? Who would have similar life circumstances and live to tell about them? And as I thought of that, I was reading in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 15. And there is a character in our text which, to whom I relate well. It is Barabbas. At the end of Mark 14, Jesus has been betrayed, he's been arrested, he's been brought before the council of Jewish leaders. Having been condemned to death by the religious leaders, there remained a problem. Even though they condemned him to death, they didn't have the authority to carry out that sentence. For that, they needed the help of Pontius Pilate. Which brings us to our text for this morning. It's found in Mark chapter 15, verses 1 through 15. As soon as it was morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council, and they bound Jesus and led him away and delivered him over to Pilate. And Pilate asked, them, asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? And he answered him, You have said so. And the chief priests accused him of many things. And Pilate again asked him, Have you no answer to make? See how many charges they bring against you? But Jesus made no further answer, so that Pilate was amazed. Now at the feast, he, was used, to he used to release for them one prisoner for whom they asked. And among the rebels in prison who had committed murder in the insurrection, there was a man called Barabbas. And the crowd came up and began to ask Pilate to do as he usually did for them. And he answered them, saying, Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? For he perceived that it was out of envy that the chief priests had delivered him up. But the chief priests stirred up the crowd to have him release for them Barabbas instead. And Pilate again said to them, then what shall I do with the man you call the king of the Jews? And they cried out again, 
crucify him. And Pilate said to them, why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, crucify him. So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released for them Barabbas, and having scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. This is the word of God. Jesus is on trial, and the judge believes he is innocent. Luke records this. Wanting to release Jesus, Pilate appealed to them again, but they kept shouting, crucify him, crucify him. For the third time he spoke to them, why? What crime has this man committed? I have found no grounds for the death penalty. Therefore, I will have him punished and then release him. But the crowd was having no nothing of it. They wanted Jesus dead. Three times Pilate declares Jesus innocent. But he's a political being, and he's been backed into a corner. He needs to try and save face with the Jews, but he also wants Jesus to be set free. He, he can't allow the, the city to fall into chaos, which he is pretty sure would happen if he let Jesus go. But conveniently for Pilate, it was that time of year where he could set a prisoner free. One prisoner could walk away, which gives Pilate the opportunity to get out of that corner, to save face, offer them two prisoners, and get the crowd to choose. Make it a popular vote. The winner of the popular vote gets to go free. Jesus or Barabbas? Jesus, you know, the one who healed the sick and raised the dead? Jesus, who called out the hypocrisy of the religious elite and ate and drank with the outcasts and the tax collectors and the sinners. Jesus, that good guy who, who doesn't appear to have done anything wrong. Jesus, who fed thousands of people, who held children, who taught with authority and conviction. Jesus, who less than a week before this, rode into Jerusalem on a donkey to the crowd saying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Jesus. That's choice number one. The other is Barabbas. Who is Barabbas? The rebel. He's a murderer. A man with anger in his heart and blood on his hands. Defiant, violent, a troublemaker, a life taker. Barabbas, undeniably guilty. Or Jesus, undeniably good. Surely the people would choose Jesus. It seems like a no-brainer. But they didn't. They chose to let the guilty man walk free, and they chose to let the good man die. And this is where I find myself resonating with Barabbas. I think maybe you will too as we carry on. Barabbas was guilty, but he was set free. A guilty one set free. Jesus taking his place. It is highly likely that the cross that had been set aside for Barabbas was carried by Jesus. Barabbas is set free because someone else took his place. Jesus substituted for Barabbas. Jesus taking the punishment that should have been meted out on Barabbas. Jesus literally carries the cross that Barabbas was going to carry. He bore the guilt and shame and curse and disgrace and death that, the, that Barabbas deserved. And he bore the guilt and shame and curse and disgrace and death that I deserve. And he bore the guilt and shame and curse and disgrace and death that you deserve. When Jesus died for Barabbas, he died for me. He died for us. When Barabbas was set free, I was set free. 
When Barabbas was set free, you were set free. Because of the death of Jesus, we are all given an opportunity to be set free. As we look at this passage and consider the proceedings of this trial, there was a profound discovery in all of the arguments and all of the discussions. Barabbas was never once cleared of guilt. He was never found to be innocent of the charges brought against him. He was proven guilty, and that never changed. The focus is not on the guilt of Barabbas. The focus is on the fact that Jesus was innocent. Jesus was the focal point of the proceedings, and the same is true for all of us. As we stand before God, clearly we are all guilty. For all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. This is proven. It is undeniable. All we have to do is look critically in a mirror and ask ourselves, have we sinned? And the answer is yes. The point is not whether we are guilty of or deserving of condemnation because we are. The point is that the innocent one has died for us. Jesus is the focal point of Barabbas' freedom. He is the focal point of our freedom as well. The one, he is the one who will make the difference in this way. I am like Barabbas. In this way, all who accept Jesus Christ are like Barabbas. We are guilty ones who have been set free. And there's a second way in which I find myself similar to Barabbas. Barabbas actually had to accept his freedom. Nothing more is actually said about Barabbas, not in Scripture, not in recorded history. Barabbas just disappears. There was a book written about him in 1950. It was made into a movie starring Anthony Quinn in 1961. Another rendition was filled in 2012. I actually had the opportunity, I took the opportunity to watch that movie again this last week the one from 1961, and it's probably worth a look uh, if you think in terms of, I am Barabbas. Uh, the movies are completely made up. The book is fiction. We don't know much about the life of Barabbas, but here is one thing we can say for absolute certain. Barabbas, on Easter Sunday was not sitting in a prison. He wasn't there with a cell door unlocked, continuing to act like a prisoner. Barabbas would not have said, you know, Pilate, actually, I don't deserve to be set free, so put me back in prison. I'll just stay here. You know, come to think of it, I kind of deserve crucifixion, so go ahead and crucify me. Although, Interesting, that has happened. In 1829, some of you remember this, in 1829, two men, a guy named by the name of George Wilson and his partner James Porter, robbed a United States mail carrier. No doubt they were looking for ballots of some sort. And maybe not in 1929. For some reason, they decide to rob a mail carrier. And in the process, they shot the guy and killed him in cold blood. Now, here's a, just a sidelight. If you're going to rob a mail carrier, don't kill him. But before that, don't even rob him. But anyway, these two guys thought for some reason, good idea, let's rob a mail carrier. Bad idea, the guy you know, tried to resist him and then they shot him and killed him. And then they got caught. And then they got tried in a court of law. And they were found guilty. And they were sentenced to death. And they were set to be hung on July 2nd, 1830. James Porter died that day. But George Wilson did not. Turns out, he had some well-connected friends. It's always good to have well-connected friends, but it's even better not to do stupid stuff like murder somebody. But anyway, 
One of his friends was a friend of the president, Andrew Jackson. And so some of George Wilson's friends appealed to the president for mercy. And Jackson issued a presidential pardon of George Wilson. We could see some presidential pardons in a little while, sometime in the next few months. Strangely, George Wilson refused to accept the pardon. No one knew what to do because it had never happened before. So eventually the case makes it all the way to the Supreme Court and Chief Justice Marshall summarized their ruling. A pardon is an act of grace. It is a slip of paper, the value of which is determined by the acceptance of the person to be pardoned. If it is refused, it is no pardon. George Wilson will be hanged. And hanged he was. When Pilate took a vote on who to release that day so long ago, the people asked for Barabbas, and he was released from prison. He walked out. Maybe he ran out. He took the free gift and left the sea. He left to celebrate his freedom. He left to tell everyone how he was released. He left to go back to his life, to live as one who received undeserved grace. That is Barabbas. That is me. That is you. If you have accepted the substitutionary death of Christ for you. And if you haven't done that, then you're still in prison. But you can do it now. Today, in simple faith, walk out of the prison of your life into the freedom of Christ because Christ has died for us. I am Barabbas, guilty but set free. But I'm only set free if I accept my freedom in Christ. And there's something else about Barabbas which makes this story resonate with me. He had to actually choose to live in freedom. I know there's nothing else recorded about Barabbas, but generally speaking, I think that's a good thing. We don't see him recorded as returning to his life in insurrection, murder, and thievery. We presume that he lived free. He didn't get uh, go back to prison cell each night. He didn't have to keep watching over his shoulder in fear that he would be arrested again. He was allowed to live free. This is the core message of Christianity. Christ exchanged his righteous life for our rotten lives by paying for our sins through his death and resurrection from the dead. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul gives us a concise summary of the gospel. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. Jesus didn't come to make bad people good, but to set condemned people free. Our freedom, our pardon is undeserved, unexpected, and unconditional. And we are given the opportunity to live free free from guilt, even though we're guilty, free from fear, even though fear is rampant. But we have to accept the gift, and then we have to embrace the life of freedom offered to us. And this is, for me, where the rubber often hits the road, because it is so hard. We know we deserve death. We know, we know our secret sins. As part of the human condition, we often carry with us a burden of those sins, even though they are forgiven, even though the price for our sins has been paid. We've been offered a pardon, but we need to accept it so that we can live in the freedom offered by Christ. In the movie, the book and the movie Barabbas, the writer walks us through the fictional life of Barabbas from the day of his pardon 
to his eventual crucifixion. He is set free, and he watches the crucifixion of Christ. He hears of the resurrection, but he doesn't believe it. He encounters the apostles early on after the resurrection. He, his former lover becomes a believer, and she is stoned to death for proclaiming Jesus Christ as Barabbas watches. Grief ridden, Barabbas actually returns to his criminal ways, and he gets caught attempting to stone one of the priests who was responsible for the death of his former lover. And he gets sentenced to work in the sulfur mines. He spends 20 years in the sulfur mines, much of it chained to a believer in Jesus Christ. As you can imagine, when he finds out that he's chained to Barabbas, there's some tension. But over the years, this believer in Jesus Christ continues to live out his faith in Christ and learns the hard lesson of love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Eventually, through a, a number of fictionalized and fantastic things, Barabbas and his cellmate are freed to become gladiators. And as gladiators, they learn, they, they learn to fight, they learn to kill. And this Christian wins a battle. And you know how the gladiators in the, in the Colosseum, when you got the guy down, they, the, the crowd voted. Thumbs up, he got to live. Thumbs down, he got to die. And the Christian won the battle, and they, the crowd put their thumbs down, and he refused to kill. He laid down his weapons. It didn't bode well for him. He ends up dying, thrown into this hastily made pit. Barabbas eventually wins, and he gets set free as a, as a victorious gladiator. And when he does, he goes out, and he finds the grave of the man ultimately led him to understand the power of Christ. He takes his body into the, into the catacombs of Rome because he knew that that's where the Christians buried their dead. And there he meets more Christians. And while he's there, Rome catches on fire. And you know, Nero claimed the, the Christians were doing it. Barabbas is no intellectual giant. He says, well, I guess if the Christians are burning Rome, I'm going to become one of them. And he starts burning houses in Rome. And he gets caught. And he gets crucified. Because he stood with Christ. Twisted life, made up story. But when I think of Barabbas in Scripture, when I think of the one who was in a prison cell, convicted of violent crimes, of murder, of insurrection, of thievery. When I think of this one sitting there not knowing Jesus Christ and Jesus dying on his behalf, I think that's me. That's, that's me. And it's you. For all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And when we didn't know Christ, when we were still at odds with him, he died for us. What remains for us is to accept the pardon offered to us in Jesus Christ, to choose to live in the freedom of Christ, and to honor his name. Barabbas and me were cut from the same cloth because we are sinners saved by grace. Amen? Let's pray together. Our gracious and almighty God, we thank you. We thank you that you sent Jesus for us. That all of us who have sinned have been desperately in need of someone to get us a pardon. 
We thank you for the pardon available to us in Christ. If there's anyone in the hearing of my voice who has not accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior, not accepted that pardon, I pray that you would motivate them right now. Say, I don't understand it all, Lord Jesus, but I'm taking it. I want your pardon. I believe that your work counted for me. Or for those of us that have done this, allow us to leave here this morning in the marvel of the love of Jesus. In whose name we pray, amen.